day to my fellow poetry enthusiasts and welcome to our analysis of The Garden of Love by William Blake, the very first in our series of plush analyses where we'll be trimming off the frills and taking you right into the contents of the poem. So let's dive straight in. And starting right up with the title, The Garden of Love. At first glance, you'll notice that this is a proper noun, so it is referring to a very specific place. Now, what is this garden of love? That could have multiple interpretations. I mean, firstly, it could evoke that image of the Garden of Eden, which is essentially biblical for paradise, the world prior to sin. It could also be looking at the innocence of childhood, since a garden is a place of freedom and it withholds a cultivation of beauty. So childhood. And finally, the Garden of Love is an allegorical satire of the church, specifically the Church of England, towards which Blake was extremely hostile. He opposed the monarchy and the use of religious dogma. So stanza one. I went to the Garden of Love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst, where I used to play on the green. Here we see the poet revisiting the Garden of Love, which was once an open green piece of land where he would play with his friends, with people of different genders. And now he's surprised and dismayed to see that this place has been taken over and replaced by a church. A chapel has popped up right in the middle of the place which he enjoyed as a child. This renders a tone of shock to the first stanza. Now in line three, we'll see the word chapel for the very first time and the C is capitalized. This definitely gives the chapel a central position in this garden and a very important place at that. It represents man-made oppression. Now the chapel is that church which when we grow older, we notice it has more power over its people than perhaps God himself. This, of course, has to do with social constructs. Now, in line four, we see that the garden represented a place of innocence, where joy prevailed and it transcended, you know, borders of gender. And this was your playground of the speaker. And the church has taken up an oppressive role in this space. Religion has destroyed the Garden of Love. There is no longer any joy there. The innocence of youth has been taken away. We see the word green also coming up, and that represents nature, the harmony between man and nature, which is again stolen. Innuendo comes through here as well, and basically we see that the setting is destroyed by the church. Stanza 2. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore. Here in line five, we see that the speaker attempted to enter the chapel, but was unable to gain access, and that this gate was shut. Now, they don't say that it was closed, which would be still more moderate. And perhaps you could gain access. But this shot represents a finality that there was never going to be an acceptance and an entrance. In line six, we see the warning, thou shalt not. I'm going to highlight that in red. And that refers to the Ten Commandments which are found in the Old Testament, such as thou shalt not kill or commit adultery. This is not one specific commandment. But generally, all of these commandments which restrict the people, and Blake believed this to be quite the source of inequality and helplessness amongst the people. You'll also find a period at the end of this warning, which basically represents that this is a whole list of rules and not one in singularity. Line 7 brings in a juxtapositioning as he once more turns to the garden of love. And then we see sweet flowers. This is imagery of love, pleasure, natural beauty, and, and ties in with the 
green used in stanza one, which represents growth, fertility, and spring. However, we see the word po right at the end, which is past tense, meaning there's been a passage of time and perhaps there's been change over that time. On to stanza three. And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. The poet is greeted by the opposite image of his childhood. Adverse changes have taken place and there are now graves and tombstones where he would have expected to see flowers. The beauty and joy of flowers are forbidden by this church, and so these graves represent a death of freedom. And his dreams and imagination lie under the weight of these tombstones. In this case, the church would be going against the Catholic belief of supporting nature. In the final two lines, we see some internal rhyme coming through. And if we come right over here, we see priests in black gowns. Now, it is capitalized because these priests loom large in this space. And their black gowns are symbols of mourning and despair, since black is often a color of mourning and grief. They are walking their rounds. This is very mechanical, very methodic. It's, it's associated with simply following a set routine. There's no real concern. There's no care. There's no remorse or feeling towards the people they are meant to be serving, but rather they're just doing their duties methodically. In the final line, we see some alliteration coming through as well. And this basically shows a restraint against desire that is being enforced. Briars are thorny branches, so this depicts quite visually how painful these restrictions really can be and what an adverse effect it can have on the people. The joys and desires which they have could really include anything like physical pleasures, which are then denied by the rules of this institution. And usually these acts were labelled as sin. Now this brings up the topic of hypocrisy, because often with priests, you would find them preaching against things such as, you know, sexuality and gluttony, and then they themselves would go ahead and perform these deeds. And so the speaker is really not fond of this, and he sees how the church is controlling the people and is being oppressive, taking away their innocence and joy while they are enjoying these things they have labelled as sin. Now this takes us right back to our title where I drew your attention to its relation to the Garden of Eden. In actuality, the Garden of Eden is also a place associated with sexual freedom. And that's quite ironic since, of course, that is very much what the priests were preaching against. And when you look at it, man is then being controlled by guilt and the shame really imposed by the church not really righteousness. So the garden could be symbolic of a place within ourselves where we store our primal emotions. While you're looking over the tone and themes listed below, I just wanted to draw your attention to a few contrasts we find in the poem. In the first stanza, the lines are rather short, and this is contrasted with much longer lines in the final stanza. This emphasises the short-lived joy that we find in the first stanza, as opposed to that decay and death, which is long and drawn out in the final stanza. There's a contrast between the beauty of flowers and that grey dullness of graves and tombstones. There's the contrast also between pastoral and gothic imagery. The priests are basically seen as prison guards. So in this poem, what we find is a transition from this image of idyllic beauty to one of a gloomy dystopia. In summary, the speaker describes revisiting a place he remembers from his childhood, only to find that it has been taken over by a church 
and he cannot enter. And as he explains the surrounding of the garden, he finds that the place is no longer joyful and that there is a mood of oppression brought about by this church. And that's all for this time. Don't forget to subscribe, like and share. And I'll see you on the next one.